two years. Yeah. And this is my second year. Yeah. So, but this part of the work is called the module we're doing is research in practice. Right. So it's mostly theory as well as philosophy. Yeah. So you write an essay, do you? Or so or just a dissertation. It's a sort of dis dissertation. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm going to have that for January time. Yeah. And I was going to make this part of my dissertation. Um, okay. Yeah. And I'll at least extract some of this from. Um, you can use bits of it as you wish. Thank you. Bits of it, you know, whatever, yeah. Okay. That's that's what I need, yeah. And that's really quite, quite a, uh, well, apart from being interested in what you do, well, I really, it's something I really like doing myself. Yes. Um, and Sorry. it's something I want to continue doing. So, uh, how should we start? Well, if I. S <laughs> You're recording, are you? Yeah. I think so. Uh, what I've got there, that's a lemon wood block made by Chris Daunt, who lives in Newcastle. Yeah. I think he used to work at uh, Lawrence's. And he makes all the blocks for Intaglio printmakers in London. Yeah. And for lots of other people as well, I'm sure. So I get my blocks from him or from Lawrence and Son, in, uh, who are in Cornwall, in Red Ruth. I think that's where they are. All online. Yeah. I, used to, I used to go to London... The Bleeding Heart Yard, where Lawrence's used to be, yeah. and you could look at the blocks and buy them. And yep. I do sometimes buy boxwood blocks, and I make them as well. I get odd bits of wood and cut, sort of cut it up and use. It and but I I buy in batches usually. Yep. That's a standard size that one. Yep. And so I've got a a, line, a drawing. It's all based on drawing, really. Yeah. Although yeah. it's a process. It's a printmaking process, so I might start with a, you know, I'll make an image. Um, I draw from life, and I did a lot of life drawing as a student yeah. in my early years, and during my degree course, which was in painting. So I did a couple of years foundation studies, and I then did a painting degree for three years, and a postgraduate painting course as well. So I did quite a lot of traditional painting, although my work was fairly abstract as a student, and it, it remains fairly abstract, my painting work and my drawings. But I did observational drawing, <coughs> and a lot of those were concerned with structure, form, the figure, kind of marks really, little marks to convey a sense of space and form and movement really. Yeah. And um, I did a lot of printmaking at the Central School, taught by Norman Aykroyd and various other people. Blair Hughes Stanton was a lecturer there as well. Yeah. A man called Peter Nell um, and Leonard Marchant who was a mezzotint printmaker and the printmaking bit studio was right beside the painting studios on the top floor of the Central School of Art at that time so that you could do printmaking and life drawing and painting in the studios close by each other and I'd learned how to etch, did a bit of screen print and lithography and I'd lino cut up to a point and previously at school I did a lot of sculpture as a kind of 15 year old I suppose 16, 17 and I very nearly studied sculpture, so I did my foundation course and was gravitating towards sculpture. But I eventually thought painting would be a better... I was really t I was torn between that, I think, three dimensions. And I then um, did that and left college and did a fellowship in Cheltenham, a sort of one year, a kind of one year painting fellowship after I left college. And uh, at that time I had some tools, sculpture tools and printmaking tools, pencils, pens, all that, all the equipment. And my work had a strongly three-dimensional side to it. And my paintings were quite a lot of canvas and collage and linen and paper, kind of layered imagery that was quite three-dimensional. And I started to do some wood cut prints on side grain, wood. And I had some engraving tools and, and blocks, I think from college days, which I'd never used. 
and I started to uh, do that about three or four years after I graduated from art school. So I've got, and from when I started to do those prints, I'm just transferring the drawing onto the block. It's the same way around. It'll come out backwards, of course. Yeah. And I've got a tabletop, uh, a vessel, and a window, which is a kind of motif. Yeah. And when I started to do these sort of small-scale prints, a lot of imagery emerged from my imagination mainly, although I was still doing drawings of things from life, mainly of things on tables with... I had a very nice studio in Stroud which had a, a north-facing window with these sort of avocado stones that had grown into avocado plants in bottles on this windowsill. And I did drawings of a basket with stones. These are all East Anglian stones here mm -hmm. in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And I had the same sort of thing in my studio in 1979. And they were just arrangements of things on windowsills, quite untidy. This is rather tidy here at the moment. And they were drawings of kind of exactly the same sort of subject. <clears throat> and so when I started to work on uh, <coughs> blocks, I discovered that <coughs> there was graphic imagery that, that emerged and kind of decorative sculptural imagery of animals and fish and plants which hadn't really emerged in my uh, painting mm -hmm. although some of the some of the qualities were the same so I'm yeah. just I'm just doing line work yeah with this and I'm cutting away from the edge of that this is the vessel this is the table top so I cut away from the corner so that I don't overshoot, which is one of the hazards of engraving, you can overshoot. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to cut towards the, the vessel, yeah. and then come out the other side over here. Mm. So I started to make these, these uh, prints, which I greatly enjoyed as a kind of sculptural process, in a way. The tools and the wood and the image is a shallow relief and it's a kind of ambidextrous process, so I'm using all of my body, really. Yeah. So it's like my wrist and my fingers yeah, yeah, and my yeah. hand, but it's actually sitting down and I'm using yeah. the table. You know, it's kind yeah, of... Yeah. It, it involves the whole body, I think. I worked with a, a calligrapher in Newcastle uh, called Manny Ling, who's a Chinese artist who teaches at Sunderland. We invited, uh, I made a little film about his calligraphy. And he started his talk by saying, I've got to have my feet. And so he put his feet on the ground yeah, like that. Yeah. And, then, and then eventually, he was sort of sitting at the table, he had the paper and the brush and the ink, grinding the ink and the whole thing about the ink and the tools and the brush and the paper and the feet. Yeah, yeah. It was all about his sort of, it was like Zen really, yeah, about sure. being yeah, in yeah. the right kind of. Yeah. Uh, mood. Okay. You so don't. You don't use your left hand, except. Or do you use your left hand as a, as a break? I just use it to move the block, really, to hold the block like yeah, that. Yeah, as a break, sort of. Yeah. So I'm using my right hand really to make the marks. Like yeah. That. So there we've got the basic sort of composition yeah, of an image yeah, with yeah. a table and a, a table and a sort of jug or a vessel. Yeah. And I'm quite interested in. Uh, I mean, I'm, I think I'm interested in dividing the surface in a way. So a lot of my paintings are have crosses and sort of structures of things like that. Yeah. So I often use then I use the square-ended one. And I take away the the edge sometimes of the image like so. You shouldn't really cut towards the edge like that because it splits. Yeah, yeah. But I do anyway. Yeah sometimes. I'm not really a purist. I'm a purist about the materials, I think. Yeah. And there's quite a lot of debate about... I use this to... just to square that off. Tidy up that edge like that. You've that's, cut that quite deep as well. That's quite useful. Yes, that's fairly deep. Yeah. There's no harm in cutting it deep. Yeah. A lot of engravers are quite, are quite shallow. 
I mean, there's a material called Trotec that, that engravers use, which is, a, which is a kind of plastic, a very nice, it's a very expensive, or quite an expensive plastic material. Yes. And you just use the same tools. It's actually a very nice material. Yeah. But it is nonetheless a, a plastic. Yeah. So, and a lot of the, there are wood engravers who are just doing exactly the same thing using using resin grave or something else and, and they call them wood engravings and of course the, I don't think they are wood engravings I think they are plastic engravings and I think they should be named as such Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. really although I think people disagree with that and I often say to students that the the ink the block doesn't actually touch the paper because, so there I've got a, a sort of table slightly out of perspective, which I quite like. Yeah. Um, and then there's the window, and I'm just going to do a dividing line there. So I personally think that wood, the wood and the paper and the ink and the metal are the best materials for wood engraving. And the ink, obviously, the ink, the paper, the wood, the metal, and that physicality of those those materials is important, I think, particularly in a rather digital age that we live in. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions. Although, I although I respect I, a lot of the students that I teach use electronic imagery for their work, and they do they do very interesting things with it. They express themselves. It's it's not something that particularly inter interests me, though. So I do that. I sometimes use a putty rubber. I can find that. Just to remove bits of wood, whatever, yeah. Bits of wood, really. Yeah. And the pencil drawing. Oh, God. Yeah. It's got a, it did start with a very simple pencil drawing. Yeah, yeah. This is not a very good putty rub, but it leaves a deposit on the block. So this is an end grain block. Yeah. That's what makes it a wood engraving. Yeah. The wood cut is on the side grain. Yeah. It's 23.3 millimetres thick, which is type high. That's to say it can be set with letter press type type. But again, that's something I, I'm, I'm doing. This is very bad form doing it like this, because you can see where it's split off. But I'm not going to use that edge, so I don't mind. And of course, a lot of the original letter forms were either engraved or cut yes. out of wooden from wooden blocks. From wooden blocks, yes. Yeah. So there's a, there's a direct link between wood engraving and typography, which I think is important. Just working on that. I so I'll take that away. Lemon wood is is quite coarse compared to boxwood, as you can see. Yeah. That's not bad though. The, the, it's rough, but the edge is quite sharp there. It's sharp enough. It crumbles a bit sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've got a basic, yeah. a sort of basic composition there. <clears throat> I think. I it's hope. Lovely. <laughs> lovely. Absolutely. Um, lovely. And I could just. Uh, not sure what to do next. Don't want to over. I mean, one of the great enemies, I think, of of some printmaking processes, particularly wood engraving, is the tendency to overwork something. Yeah. Because it's very tempting to go on and on. <clears throat> I'm just going to put something here on this. But when you your first question on your list, yeah, is why do you make yes, why do you make why, you know? I mean, it was one. Of, it was the thing that I was best at as a child. So quite early on in my primary school. 
twice, you know, literally at the age of six or so. I became, or even younger possibly, I became interested in art, or certainly doing art. My father gave me a little book about Van Gogh when I was quite young, and I just drew a lot, and was quite, that was the place I, I gravitated towards the art room, I think. <clears throat> so I was encouraged, I wasn't, I was quite good at English but not terribly academic in other subjects so I, I really was an artist at school from a young age and uh, I you know, got more specialised, more, more keen on it as the years passed. Yeah. This is a doorway it's a doorway out of the picture. Okay. It's a sort of. I think art. Why you know I make art. I think for the same reason that ever anyone else does. Really, I think it's part of. It's part of our our, our world. I think. You need people who are very good at words and science and everything else but you also need the visual expression and there are enough museums and art galleries in the world I think to prove its 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 necessity I think mm -hmm. and I wanted to be involved with that as a professional artist really from a young age and I knew that it, I was always told it was a difficult profession. <clears throat> so there is a little doorway. And I've left a little bit there. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. And I may and and I have, you know, I have sold my work. I've exhibited my work. Yeah. And I've got him very involved with teaching as well. And it's. I sometimes, I've been into primary schools and talked to pupils about art and of course they know about Van Gogh and they know about Egyptian art and so on and I always say you know we're sitting in this room and there's a clock there's a bookcase there's a table there's a computer there's a carpet as well you know and all of those things have been designed by someone who probably went to art college every single thing in this room probably you know has, has a kind of visual aspect or yeah. and you have product design and ceramics and fabric and fashion and shoes and books of course full of illustrations yep. and typography and, and that's part of it as well as well as a painting which is of course I, lo I love paintings and fine art but sort of, I've become more appreciative I think of, of design I think since since getting involved with um, teaching and so on so I'll just do a little bit more to that yeah so we've got a door so the second question is... Well, the is second it, question was, do you what's think the second question? art is important in the world? I think you pretty much, pretty much told me that, but um, how, how art is important in the world. Um, how art is important? Why is it important in why the is world? It important, well, yeah. it's, like, it's a bit like saying why, why is music important or why is poetry important? And of course, music is abused, and you know, there's good music, there's great music, and just like art and just like poetry, there's it's part of culture, which is is it has to be important because it's we preserve it, and there are there are buildings devoted to it, and I think it expresses things that can't be expressed in in any other way. I think that's why that's why it's important because it's the only way to to express that particular aspect of the the human condition. I think. Well, that's almost that's almost finished. I just need to do something else. I think. <clears throat> um, but I think. I think it's a reflection of 
society, the art that you the art that you see in in a museum or the art that is made in the 21st century or the 19th century reflects that time. So it's connected to history and politics and you know human relationships. Yes. And ideas, it's the sort of the world of ideas, really. And I think it's very evident when you hear Grayson Perry or Damien Hirst or someone like that talking about their work, is that there, there, is, a, there is a kind of sociological or a conceptual idea which is of its time. And sometimes that doesn't connect very well with the general public. sometimes misunderstood or people say they can't understand modern art and I've heard you know very intelligent educated or so-called educated people saying just that which proves I think that it's the art that is at fault if they say they, if they can't understand it it means the art is either too obscure yeah and it should, it should, it should really communicate. I, th I feel just as as music should. Of course, some music is difficult to listen to, and uh, you have to kind of give it time and practice listening to it. And I think that's the same with art. I think you have to you have to work at looking at it and kind of find you have to find out what the artist was trying to do, perhaps. But I think the art really should it should communicate. So I've just put a few things into that bowl. There we are. I'm just going to do a little bit more to the. That is lovely. Here. I want to use the tool. I want to use the tools in a in a way. <clears throat> okay. What's the next question? Well, I think we've sort of got that? to because uh, um, we talked about art being accessible to. To the general public, yeah. Uh, which you said why is it important? Know. I think I think I said why it's important. You have there, yeah. yeah that's yeah. yeah. Um, the next one is, do you uh, inspired? Well, I I think certainly the early books I looked at, the early, the early things I saw in galleries. I went to the Tate Gallery when I was quite young. I saw a Van Gogh. I saw a you know, an Andy Warhol exhibition in about 1961, yeah. of the which had the Brillo pad. Oh yes, you know, yeah, and it yeah. was at the Tate. My mother took me to the Tate Gallery. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I have could I have your view about Andy Warhol's work? Well, I think he was a good illustrator. Actually, he did drawings of shoes and. I think he's a. Clever graphic artist, the screen prints, although he didn't do them himself, I don't think. But they're iconic images, certainly. I never liked his work. It was quite dominant in my student days in the 70s. He, 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 he yeah. was a you know huge artist, American. There was a big influence from a lot of American artists in London, I think, at that time. Yeah. And certainly the art college staff who taught me were quite in awe of America, I think. Yeah. In a good way, probably. And it was very exciting. Big paintings, you know, expressionist, abstract, and... I mean, there was quite a lot of work that wasn't abstract. Um, it wasn't all... There was, I suppose, there was a dominance of abstraction, probably. So I'm now just doing lines that are close together, and I change the angle. What For some you reason, I'm not sure why I do that, but I've always done that. Is that a line tool? Is this is the same tool, actually. I've done most of the work with this tool. Which is the line. This is a spit sticker. Oh, yes, yeah. But I was very influenced by Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, yeah. uh, Graham Sutherland. I didn't actually go to Coventry Cathedral, 
but that was created in my childhood and all those artists did things at Coventry. Uh, Ivan Hitchens and Paul Nash were big influences, I think. Yes, yeah. And Paul Clay. I mean, they, they remain the most important, I think, all those artists, really. Um, I was very keen on Gwen John's work. Sonia Delaunay, the, the... Oh, yes. Uh, I liked very much. Sculptors, Giacometti. Yeah. It's a huge influence on my drawing when I was a student. I think I did rather Giacometti-esque drawings. So I'm now fanning out these lines just for fun, really. See what effect. I would, I'd say I'd want to improvise every single block. So I haven't really planned this at all. It's entirely improvised. It's a kind of idea of a still life. That's that. So I've got a, still a few bits of wood. That's all the line work I've done on the tabletop. And I'm just going to do yeah, a little bit more to the floor. Yeah. I'm going to use this big one, that one. Yeah. It's just clearing a bit, isn't it? And with this one is 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 I've discovered it's wonderful for making sort of it's just you can do things with a like that you can use it on the edge yeah. so I'm going right through like that like that. Then I'll go down this way. And then I can use this one, which is a square one, just on the edge of that line. Like that. So that's kind of let some light in to the image, yeah, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. So we've got a door, we've got a vessel with a kind of motif on it, and then a little bowl. I could do something to that. <clears throat> this is the square-ended one. And I'm going to put a tree, so the tree outside the window. I think I'm really essentially a line artist, probably. Yes. You know, I use a lot of line yeah. as a... Yeah, I've just sort of seen it. Yeah. You know, I quite like sort of rhythmical and... So there's a branch. They are based on real trees, but they're not terribly real, my trees. They're a sort of equivalent of a tree, I think. A rather abstracted tree. It's yes. a winter. There's a winter. That's a winter tree. Yeah. It's broken up a little bit on that edge, so I'll just trim that off. <clears throat> and I'm going to use that tool. Try and use a, a range of tools. So I'm just going to do a line. One there. A bit further. That gives you a much more even, slightly thicker line. Yeah. And then we'll go up here. That's it. Right. So there we have an image. <clears throat> so then I move over to this bit over here. I do the iron on this page as well. <clears throat> I have this glass. That's 
so. Um, you can use a, I've got a brush somewhere just get rid of all the bits. Yeah. Here. That's that's not quite strong enough. That's that's okay. Yes, that just gets any any bits of foreign bodies out of the ink out of the there, that's there. Got some rollers over here. These come from TN Lawrence. So that's just that, that's a softer one, that one. Yeah. Slightly softer. It's quite a good roller. Yeah, I like those, yeah. And this is a slightly harder one. So that's yeah. the one I would use. Yeah. And, uh, it's an ink somewhere. This is Lesser Press Black Ink, carbon black. Is it oil based? It's oil based, yeah. I've tried water based ink, but I can't. I can't get a good print with water based ink. I've yeah. tried. Yeah. The art college has gone over to safe. And that's called the ink bed. It's a bit like a bed, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You can smell the ink, it's a very oily. Quite a good quality ink. They have three different, I think three or four different sorts of black. This is carbon black, which is a warmer black. Yeah. That's like that. It's got a <clears throat> there's a little fleck there. That's called a hickey. If you get that in uh, your print, yeah. a little bit of it's fuzzing, yeah. a little block of a little bit of dust yeah. is called a hickey in the printing trade. So you want to sort of vel you want it to make that noise really. Yes. You can see when it's even, yeah. evenly distributed. It's all about transferring that. Yeah. <coughs> Put some paper somewhere. Piece of Arakaji natural paper. Uh -huh. That's a Japanese paper. Is it? Yeah. That's the rough side. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. the smooth side, which is the one that I use. Yeah. So I usually put it like that. Make sure there's no bits. Just, I mean. When I said that the block never touches the paper, it's because there's a layer of ink in the way. So it's, the, it's actually the ink that touches the paper. Of course. And so if it's wood or plastic or metal or something else, rubber, I do rubber prints. So that's the smooth side of the paper. I do it by eye. Sometimes I put a grid underneath if I'm doing an addition of prints. So you can put lines so you can line it up. Just press it down. It's quite sticky ink. So it's like that. And I usually stand here. Yeah. Like this. And put it there like that. <clears throat> I sometimes put this underneath. I have had back trouble at times, so I'm alright at the moment. Because if you're working all day, you, you know, you're like that. And then you, so I, I can stand like that quite easily. And you're supposed to use a little bit of paper as a mask if you do hand burnishing. I'll just find a little piece of printing paper. I don't bother actually, but I will for your benefit <laughs> because you can you can damage the paper if you yes. do a hand burnishing. Yeah. <clears throat> 
So you, you use it like that and burnish from the back. Yeah. And it's whatever has been rolled onto the block, and I, I say this to students, all you're doing is transferring it. So if it's an even coating of ink, yeah. you just have to have an even pressure and whatever's yeah. on the block will be transferred onto the paper. And I'm not a particularly hyper detailed wood engraver, I don't think. There are there are there are wood engravers who do highly detailed work mm -hmm. and they would use much less ink than this. I I, th I think I use quite a lot of ink. Yeah. But I quite like a, a strongly inked and a, and a quite a deeply I quite like to, a sort of definite image. Yeah. And so that line, I'm now just going directly onto the paper. Yeah. That line on the side of the vessel, this sort of body shape, is quite a fine line. And I can see that that's, that's printed fairly well. Yeah. And this paper is thin. Yeah. You can turn it around without touching the block like that. Yeah. I do all my all my prints like this. I do occasionally use a press, but not often. <clears throat> I, I've got when I started to print, you slip off and you can tear the paper. But I'm used, I'm quite used. I can feel the surface of the edge underneath this horn uh, spoon. It's a Chinese spoon. Mm. I use a Scottish bone spoon sometimes, an egg spoon, that my mother-in-law gave me. So bone is good, horn is good. Uh, I think the Chinese and Japanese use an agate sort of burnisher. So that, that's, that's about right. Yeah. There it is, you can yeah. see it. Yeah. You can pull it off. Wow. That's, that's, so that's the proof. Is that fine enough? That's beautiful, yeah. That is beautiful. Mm. So it's authentic. Yep. <laughs> so here we go. Prepared. There we are. Thank you. That is stunning. So it's yours. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're not, what's your next question? We're, we're, not, we're not going to get through them all, are we? No, you, know, you don't need to. It's okay. You've answered quite a few. So, um, uh, uh, next one. Uh, yeah, so, there's some interesting points there about sort of history and. Yeah. You can ask me any of those. Can I, okay. Um, I think we probably. Well, I mean, I think this one is probably important. Um, I believe you get up very early to start making the work. And it strikes me that you, you do work very hard at what you, at what you do. Mm. Um, Grace and Perry has said that it's important to put in the man hours. Yeah. Would you agree? I think that's think true, that? yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely. I think, um, I think there, is, there are skills to, that you know, that you need to learn, certainly, to make images and objects. Not sure exactly what they are, but... I have a rather traditional view, I think. Yeah. So you do drawing and learn yeah. about observation a bit and learn about imagination and interpreting a subject and making a piece of work about something. Yeah. So you, and, and, and I think even you know, Rothko, I think, had a subject, although it's a big rectangle, it's a beautiful sort of colour field painting. There is a kind of, it might be a philosophical subject, but there, he's, he's, he's got a subject there. And he's making work over a number of years about that subject from different sides, different different aspects of his emotion and, and yeah. thoughts. Yeah. And it comes out as a rather abstract image, but it's still this, there's a lot of skill in it, there's so much in in there about colour and shape and the qualities of the surface and the object and the, it's it's quite a complicated, subtle. It's a subtle. Uh, 
business making making images I think and of course each artist has a different set of those things really that they're trying to yeah. express yeah. but it's not I think the question about history and you say let's see well you ask about modern modern and and whether it's accessible or not to to people at some point I think yeah I did at some point yeah I think you fairly much answered that. That. which one um, which one would you like to talk about well, I think probably um, where, do, where does your work fit into a framework is it historical uh, contemporary abstract uh, I think I'm a product of 1953 you know I grew up at a time when the, 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 the kind of the leading British artists was a, were a group of particular artists and I, I'm sure that I, I was taught by people who uh, believed in the Bauhaus and they believed in um, constructivism and American abstract painting but there was a strong underlying discipline of life drawing which was something that you had to do and it was possibly the most difficult thing I think that we had to do and the life room was there in the, in the in the uh, studio among between the studios and that was the room in which you immediately revealed really to everybody else in the room whether you could do it or not you know so you had easels and drawing boards and 15 people standing around and as soon as you make some approximation of the figure that's in front of everybody yeah. everybody can see how well or how badly really you do it or, yeah. or how you do it and some people were able to do it quite accurately, which was impressive, I think. I still admire that, if people can draw it, sort of make it look proportional. And I think a sense, sense of proportion is a fundamental kind of, it, whatever discipline, I think, some sort of, some sense of form is important. But of course, it's you can make a very subjective, a very distorted drawing, which is wonderful as well. So, And it took me a little while to realize that. I thought it was all about accuracy yes yeah and I think that I had quite uh, I found it very difficult when I first went to art college because I had quite a an exacting kind of way of drawing probably from school and I was immediately told to stop doing that you know, draw more freely draw yeah. bigger use a you know use a big piece of charcoal or a sponge or use put your hand you know and, I, and that I was quite self-conscious but I did eventually realise that it was worth drawing with a twig or a feather or a, or a big brush yeah. you know, and, and doing something quite difficult to control that was, was quite tactile. But it took me several years to really realise why that was a good thing to do, to be a bit more liberated. That freedom of, uh, which is, is, a, is a big thing about art, I think, is that sort of freedom yeah. of expression. And, Doing exciting things with materials is um, is wonderful, I think. But the the the, uh, the question is about tradition, is it? It's about it's, 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 it's about actually where your work now fits in. But it's, it's, it's I think I, I, I'm been. sure that I I'm sure that I I fit into a kind of post-war abstraction. Uh, landscape evocative of landscape or evocative of still life where there's a where there is some relationship to the visible world but it's abstracted it's it's altered in some ways yeah and probably Picasso had a fair bit to do with that I expect yes. probably it may change though if I did a bit more work it would change probably yes because <coughs> I do my work rather I do it in my spare time. Yeah. It's been extended over many years of teaching, so I work at weekends and in the evenings like this. Yeah. And if I was working full time, I imagine on my art it might be different. It might have come out differently, I think. Yeah. You've got, you've got some what, other questions the, there? Let's have another one. There must be a particular reason you use wood as opposed yeah. to using plastic or <coughs> yes. other I've tried I've tried other materials. I like I like other materials as well. But I do think uh, I like carving wood. I like I like uh, things associated with wood, musical instruments, and 
tables and chairs and things that where wood has been used. Yeah. And I think as a print, uh, as a surface for making prints, I've looked at very old wood cuts. There's a, there's a wood cut in Venice by Barbari, isn't it? A big map of Venice, oh, yes. which, is a, which, which is a side grave <coughs> image. And I've looked at Dürer's work and Holbein and the sort of medieval uh, woodcut uh, images, Chinese and Japanese and Indian uh, woodcut prints, which are old and they're, they're still in perfect condition. You know, they're wonderful images. And of course, people are still making woodcut. The people who continue to use woodcut and wood engraving and it goes in and out of fashion, I'm sure it will continue to do that. Yeah. But people like using using wood to make prints. I think it just goes on. I mean, I'm just part of a whole hundred thousands of people all over the world kind of fiddling about with bits of wood really and making prints. It's quite a... I, I, I find it... I'm very quick. I can make a print very quickly. I've learnt how to do it and, I, and it gives me pleasure to do that. You know, it took sort of 20 minutes perhaps. Yes. And I think it's it's quite a accessible in a way. It, I yeah. can do it without a printmaking studio. Yeah. And uh, I've got all my equipment. To do 50 of those, if I did the full edition, it would take a couple of days to do the edition. Yes. Yeah. And they'd all be more or less the same. Yeah. You know, yeah, number sure. them and so on. Do you then think it's important to keep this tradition of wood print and wood engraving? Uh, I think printmaking has got, uh, I've got, a, I've got a, I know Paul Coldwell quite well, who's a, who teaches at Camberwell School of Art. He wrote a book about contemporary printmaking where you have etching and wood, wood block and so on. And of course, digital technology has come in and inks and materials have changed. So the traditions, I think, of wood engraving and wood and other forms of printmaking have been improved by, uh, by technology, I'm sure, by printing technology and ink technology. And, but I think underneath that, there's a very, there's an ancient established kind of craft, really, which I think is worth, I think it's definitely worth um, teaching people how to do it, it but, or something like it, really. So teaching people how to draw or you know, getting children to make things rather than using electronic machines which of course is important as well, but I don't think that should dominate. I think there's a, d I don't really think there's a danger of being taken over by, by iPads or by phones, although they're okay. very dominant in our society. <coughs> I use them all the time, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I think this this part of my life keeps keeps me very occupied and interested, and I'm sure that applies to lots of people. Yep. So make, using your hands to make something yep. is a, is very satisfying. It's good for the soul, I think. You called it a craft. Do you do you see it as a craft or an art or just uh, a, 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 a yes? A, I, I'm interested in. I, I think craft is a good word, and it's not mindless or or without intellect or without artistic depth. Craft. I, th I think it's sometimes seen as being a, a manual skill using materials to make something functional that not the same as a piece of fine art but I think there is there's a lot of craft involved in in making a painting really there's a lot there are a lot of materials that you have to master in a, in a, you have to understand the chemistry of the materials the tactile qualities of the materials how to how to actually put the materials on the surface of the wood or the canvas or the paper which is a, is a craft skill, really. And I think the craft is sometimes misre it's misunderstood craft, I think, slightly. It went, it went out of fashion. I, when I first went to Edinburgh College of Art, it was the School of Design and Crafts that I worked in, and it then became the School of Design. People stopped talking about craft for 10 years or so, and it, it, it became slightly unfashionable to talk about craft, and it, it seems to have I'm more acceptable now to, to talk about craft with respect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do you think do you think yourself that artists have an obligation an obligation to inform about political or social issues, or should art be autonomous and 
the outside mm. people. Well, I, th I think art outlives its its political its time. So obviously politics change and society changes, and the art is still there. So if, you know, art from the 1940s or 1920s. German art or British art from the 1930s has a certain political context and it, it reflects obviously the society of that time. But I'm not sh I think artists choose whether to address that or not. I think there's enough room, like writers and poets and musicians, you can address those things or you can address other things about the human condition. And of course, politics and society societal issues are, are are bound up in in the history of art of course they are but i don't i don't think all of art has to do one thing i think it covers a lot of all aspects of experience and i don't think one should feel ashamed of making sort of non-political work although i am told that all all art is political even if, even if you don't mean it to be you know so this is probably political yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you could write, you could say something about that representing a certain kind of yeah. idea which is a, reflects my politics probably, but even though it's unconscious. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the other answer would be, so you say to a student or someone who's aspiring to be an artist, you have to ask them, you know, who's it for, what's it for? Yeah. You're making your work, are you making it for yourself, are you, is it... Are you putting it in? Is it? Are you putting it? Do you have an audience? Or do you intend it to be seen by everybody in the street? Or in, you know, and the, and, the, and, the, and artists have to do that. Really, they have to address that. And some artists, I remember, uh, an artist who won the watercolor competition was a postman in the morning. And he was a full-time postman. And he painted, I think, for three hours a day, and he wasn't really interested in exhibiting or. Just in a, in a sense, and he didn't tell his fellow postal workers that he was an artist, and, the, and his job enabled him to buy the best watercolours and so on, and, and paint at home, really for more or less for himself, I think. So that I think you can, you can, you have to say, well, why am I doing it? Who is, who is it for? But I don't worry so much about that nowadays. Okay. Um. <clears throat> There have been varying views expressed about the need for beauty in art. In your opinion, is beauty important in the 21st century, or is it playing less of a role than in the past? Well, uh, of course it is important, uh, except that no one can agree what it is in the world, really. So architecture, music, poetry, visual art has an aesthetic uh, concern and you could say that all the greatest buildings, all the greatest symphonies and folk songs and um, sonatas are beautiful. They are universally agreed to be beautiful. But no one can quite define what that means, I don't think. But I think everybody's, I'm certainly striving for it, a sort of profound uh, quality which it's impossible to, I mean, you, it's never spoken about really at art college, about beauty. You can't, because no one can really define what is meant. So I think you, you draw the Greek sculptures, perhaps, the classical, uh, the winged victory of Samothrace is in Edinburgh College of Art, a beautiful cast of the Louvre, I think it's in the Louvre, the original one. And it's a, it's a classical sculpture from the Parthenon, I think. And uh, that, everybody agrees that it's a very beautiful thing. It's a beautiful piece of sculpture. Uh, not, not, and I, I can't really say why it is, why it's beautiful. I can't, you can't measure it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it kind of, that filters down, I think, to how do you grade, how do you mark yes, a student's yeah. portfolio? How do you, yeah. and you have to find ways of saying, does it express this or does it analyze or does it de describe? And uh, you have to kind of break it down somehow. But it, it still remains a very subjective judgment. I think that's beautiful. It's in the eye of the beholder, I think. But it's in, I think it's crucial, yes. I think the environment, I, so the schoolroom with the carpets and the clock and the books, all of those things have an aesthetic appearance, furniture, and, and they are, it's better if they're pleasing to the eye, probably, for the people who use them. It's quite difficult to define 
the principles of beauty, I think. Yes. I certainly can't. I'm, I'm not yeah. clever enough to do that. Um, I've noticed the church is featuring many of your designs. Um, is there a religious aspect in your work, or is it purely something architectural? Uh, I, th I think it refers to the landscape of the where I grew up in East Anglia, where there are many, many churches, and they kind of they punctuate the landscape in an interesting way. And I do have a spiritual side, certainly, but it's it's I wouldn't declare it. I don't think. But certainly there is a part of, going back to the previous question about beauty, there is a kind of uh, harmony, um, emotive sense of form and space and structure and relationships between colours and forms, which has a, has a, it does have a spiritual side, I think. It's, again, it's very difficult to define that, though. I would hesitate to define it. I would wreck it, I think, if I... In, in, in a way, I trust my, I trust my kind of emotion of making work. If I think about it too much, and I, I struggled at art college because there was so much theorising, and you had to justify every single thing that you did in a sort of seminar crit, critique, and I, I went through that. But but I I found that I I still found all of that a bit pretentious and, and kind of over intellectualizing but I, th I probably missed it, missed things as well because I felt it I probably didn't understand it so I, the thing about the God Christ churches is there in my work I'm sure it's there somewhere yeah, yeah. very interesting um, T.S. Eliot has said that only those who would risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Do you think that people like David Hurst and, and Mark Quinn have gone too far, or do you, do you think that they were right to test how far one can go? No, I think they are a good example of, of celebrity artists, really. They, you know, casting your, freezing your own blood in, your, in a mould of your own head is a very interesting idea, actually, and I've seen that. I saw that piece, and I... I I think you need to see the actual thing, the, the, and it's, it makes you, I think it's very clever, and I think Damien Hirst is similarly shocking and, and, and brave and, and, and sort of confrontational in his work, and, he, and again he's a product of that, of the kind of society, the art world, which is connected to the establishment, it's connected to the class system, it's connected to the history of culture of London, probably. And I think Hearst, the, the, those artists are kind of at the forefront of a certain sort of art. But underneath that, there are, you know, I, 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 I take this magazine, um, you know, there it is, this, that comes out every month. It's got, the Tate is in there, you know, yeah. and and it's got da Damien Hurst and, and, and Mark Quinner in there, but there's 300 or 400 other galleries in Torquay and in Edinburgh and yeah. where there are many, many people making art who are, who are not very famous, but they are, people are buying it, people like looking at it, like making it, and that's going on all the time. And, the, and, the, and I think the people at the forefront, the Hursts and the Mark Quinns, are... are, are they're the ones that people say, oh, I don't understand modern art, or it's outrageous, or it's yeah. it's gone too far. Okay. And, and in some ways, they have. I don't. I don't like the abuse of animals. Really, I think the Hearst. I think I. I feel that to use a cow like that and sort of put it in a gallery and sort of slice it in half and make it kind of is slightly. Uh, disrespectful, but uh, but I'm not a vegetarian, so I'm I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a difficult argument there. But I <laughs> I feel he's kind of using it in a certain way. And yeah. it is, it, and I uh, but I was shocked by seeing that yeah. piece. Yeah. It's, it was very effective. They have a, they have an effect. They really yeah. they, and I think the Mark Quinn's work as well. You you can't kind of ignore it when you look at it. It's it's a very it's designed and, to and Tracy yeah. M in as well. Yeah. And, Sarah Lucas, I think, is very sort of rude and kind of. Yeah. There, you need you need people like that, I think. 
Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, Grayson Perry has said, nothing in art is new or, or old-fashioned, only good or bad. Would you agree with that, what uh, you say? Well, I think the good or bad is, is, is comes back to the beauty discussion, because no one can really agree. Uh, I think it does. I think what happens over perhaps a 50-year period is that that Hurst and Quinn and the others, Grace and Perry, their work will remain and will be seen to be important and beautiful or profound, perhaps. But I, 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 I think you have to, it's like literature and you know, some of it is forgotten and some of it remains, I think. Yeah. It's judged really by the passage of time, I think. Yeah. There is a, I think there's an issue with the promotion of art when, you, when critics and curators and dealers, where obviously money is at stake, can promote work and, 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 and establish work so it becomes a kind of, it's collected in museums and so on. So that of course there are forces that make art um, a permanent fixture really and it's not necessarily good or beautiful necessarily but it probably has something to say, I'm sure. Uh, in, a, in a way that I think Grayson Perry is very good. He wrote, there's a book where he, sort of, he describes the art world and there is a big connection with business and value and promotion. And uh, he, he describes how it, how it works if you're a successful or not successful artist. Yeah. And I think there is an element of showmanship and um, and patronage, yeah. obviously, which which will support certain sorts of art. It's a complicated picture, though. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm yeah. a very, I'm, I'm, I'm a million miles away from that. I feel. Yeah, I've, 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 you know, I'm on a much more domestic kind yeah. of, <laughs> and I do have a slight connection with some of that, but on a very modest scale, I would say. Yeah. Okay, They're good questions, though. Very good questions, <laughs> Pat. I haven't really had to think about those questions for a while. Mark, can I ask, ask one more? Where do you see your work going in the future? Um, well, I think uh, I'm very conscious that I've made a, an effort to maintain my practice, as they call it, as, a, as an academic, so that I teach students and I... I've done that for a number of years and I've always said to students you know, these are the things I've had to think about these are the practical methods that I've used in making my work and I demonstrate or I show them how I made it and I said well this took me a few years to learn how to do this this is how I do it but I've, I've been a bit short of time really to, to, to really concentrate on my own artwork and I would like to do that so I, I I think I would spend more time developing some of my visual ideas and I, I think it will, I'm sure it will change. I think my printmaking has changed a bit. Um, I want to make some, I'd like to do a book of, uh, a sort of narrative based book of prints I think, yeah. which would be an extended series of, yeah. of engravings or something similar which have a kind of narrative structure. I think that would be interesting to do. I can't really do that at the moment. I'm not, I, I, will, I will respond to the demand, I think, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in landscape and nature and I'm interested in um, the figure. I've never felt able to deal with the human figure really in my work, although I've, I've done illustrations that are figurative and uh, I, might, I might address that. But I'm not quite sure how I, how I would do that. I think my work has been very abstract, you know, inanimate objects or windows or landscapes that that, are, that don't have many figures visible. But so I might approach the figure in some way. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Jonathan, does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. And thank you for giving me all this time. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Yes. Hey, you've come all this way. Well. You've come all the way to Scotland, <laughs> not just for this, though, have you? You haven't come up just for this, have well, you? Uh, yes. You I have? have yeah, yeah. As well to see... How did you hear about my work? Um, through Ray and Lou. Right. Uh, yes. Two years ago. Yes. Um, you came to the Open Eye Gallery, did you? I came to the Open Eye Gallery yes. two, uh, almost two years ago. It was 
Over New Year, we came yeah. to stay with Lou and Lou, right? And oh. we came.